Thanks, Mark. So, Michael, how about a time check with you? I have a 52. Uh, mine says 53. Say so yours is close enough. Close enough. So we will be beginning this, the webinar in about eight minutes. This is member economic participation. And just to remind folks who are coming on the call, anyone who wants to use the Q&A question and answer part of your toolbar to send a written question, then uh, my job, this is Michael Healy speaking, my job will be to take your question and get it over to Marilyn or whoever else might be able to answer it. So feel free to try that out anytime you want. Welcome to folks who have joined us. This is the Food Co-op 500 and CDS Consulting Co-op webinar on member economic participation. We will begin in five minutes. I'm Melon, is there anything else you need me to do as you're getting set here at the last minute? I know, Michael. I think it's fine. When After we begin, I would like for you just to um, repeat your instructions about okay. using the, the uh, question and answer so that people are, are uh, know how to use that.
So, Marilyn, how many people signed up for this? Uh, Crystal, we have about 60 people signed up from about 40 different groups. Wow. I didn't count the number of states, but they were from all over the United States. Fabulous. Six zero. <laughs> yeah, it's very exciting. Wow, that's really great. Uh, that's how many registered and uh, that we don't know, we, we don't have a way of tracking until it's over how many people are actually online. Sure. So it could be a different number, but we had a, a nice full registration. Uh-huh, very good. And we will see them start to pop up on this list here, too, as they sign on? Yes. For yeah. the folks who are participating on the web, their name will show up there. And if they are just participating by telephone, uh, we won't know that until... Actually, I don't know if we have... We'll know the number, but I don't know if we know who they are. Uh-huh. Just... So my little... Um, um, control panel says attendee list and there's 18 listed right there but I can only see our names Mark, Marilyn, Crystal, and Michael. There's another um, uh, list of attendees and you might have to open that with your little triangle to, in order to see those. You can I'm thinking them. of Crystal and Marilyn. I'm not sure, but it might only be available to folks who are set up as organizers. Uh -huh. mm, okay. I'm, not, I'm not sure what you get to actually see there, Crystal, as a panelist. Mm. That could be that I just have the three organizers and myself on there. Yeah, you might not have this other little tab then. Gotcha. Okay, and welcome to folks who have joined. Uh, this is the uh, seminar on member economic participation, and we will begin in about one minute. For people who are just coming online, uh, just to let you know again, you can ask questions using the question and answer part of your little toolbox there. There's a Q&A section. Feel free to type in a question, oh, like Robin just did, to let us know that Robin is here. Thank you, Robin. Um, hello, this is Bruce. Hello, Bruce. This Hi. is Marilyn. Hi. Sorry, I had some problems. <laughs> well, we're really glad you're here. And just so you know, I'm not able to see the webinar. My computer won't let me download the software. Okay. So, But I have everything printed out. Okay, good. Good. Well, I think that uh, we are ready to begin. So first of all, I want to welcome everyone to this webinar member economic participation. Uh, this webinar is sponsored by CDS Consulting Co-op, Cooperative Development Services, and Food Co-op 500. We had over 60 people who registered for today's seminar from 40 different organizing groups uh, in all parts of the country. And we're glad you're all here. CDS Consulting Co-op is a group of 16 consultants providing solutions for cooperative businesses. CDS is a cooperative development center with a mission of supporting cooperative development of all kinds. And Food Co-op 500 is an organization that was created in the last few years by CDS, CDS Consulting, the National Cooperative Bank, and National Cooperative Grocers Association. We began seeing an increase in the number of people and communities who wanted a food co-op in their community. And so we organized Food Co-op 500 to try to provide as many resources as we could uh, so that you could have successful startup co-ops in your community. And this webinar series is a part of that effort. Uh, today's seminar is member economic participation. Uh, there's a, this is one of a series of 12 uh, next week at the same time. Uh, there will be a, a seminar presented by Bill Gessner on creating a development budget, sources, and uses. If you haven't registered for that yet, we certainly hope that you will. Um, and the link for the registration is there on the screen. Go to that website, and that will allow you to register and download the materials for any of the seminars uh, once you register for them. Uh, and also, after this seminar is completed, we'll be posting a recording so you can download the recording and listen anytime. Um, Michael, um, could you just... Uh, remind people how they can ask questions. 
Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Michael Healy. Um, I am going to be sitting here fielding your written questions uh, and sending them to Marilyn since you all don't have voice privileges. This is a way to make sure you get to participate with your questions. So there is on your toolbar a question and answer section. Um, there's a little triangle beside the queue and question. You may need to click on that to open up uh, the box. Uh, feel free at any point to type in your questions, and uh, I will do my best to make sure they get answered. Thank you, Michael. Um, and next, uh, this is Marilyn Schultz speaking, and next I want to welcome and thank uh, two people who are going to join me on today's seminar. Uh, Bruce Meyer from Wagner LLP. Uh, Bruce is a, a CPA working out of Madison, Wisconsin with a specialty in, in cooperatives. Bruce, would you say hello? and and uh, anything else you'd like to add today? Well, uh, no, I don't. I don't think I have anything to add. But I'm, I'm happy also to answer questions, uh, you know, offline if you send me an email sometime. We've put your the link to uh, Wedner's website up there, and that has uh, people can go there to find your contact information. Uh, and second, I'd like to uh, welcome and and thank Crystal Halverson for joining us. Joining us, Crystal is the general manager of the Menominee Food Co-op in Menominee. Wisconsin. Welcome, Crystal. Thank you. Anything you want to add here before we get started? Um, I would just say that we've our co-op has we're celebrating our 35 uh, year anniversary, but we just this year converted to patronage rebate, and just a few weeks ago, with the help of Bruce Mayer, um, finally sent out our very first ever patronage rebate check, and so we've kind of recently gone through the whole process. Great. Thank you so much, Crystal. I'm sure that people will want to hear more about your experiences as we go along. Um, here's the outcomes that we're going to try to focus on today, um, that all the participants understand the cooperative's economic relationship with its member owners, uh, that we come to an understanding of the role, the challenges, and the types of equity in a cooperative, and an understanding of member benefit options and why patronage refunds are beneficial for the co-op and for the member. Uh, I also want to point out that we're bringing you the very best information that we can, but you, sh you and your group should not use this as legal or accounting advice. Um, you should retain appropriate professional services for those questions. Um, here's the outline of what we're going to cover today. We're going to start with ownership in general ownership in a cooperative, and then we're going to look at the investment side of ownership, and then we're going to look at the benefit side of ownership. Starting out with looking at ownership, we are going to first look at ownership in, in general. What does owning a business mean? And in a business, the owners assume joint responsibility for the business's success, provide the capital that finances the business, control the business, and benefit from the business that they own. The economic results of the business activity, surplus or profit, belongs to the owners. So that's true for any kind of business. What's unique about a cooperative business? Here's an image that I found recently on the gocoop.coop website. It looks at three different kinds of business structures and, and gives a, a good quick glimpse of what the difference is. In a sole proprietorship, the owner owns and controls the business. The users are other people, the general public. In an investor-owned corporation, uh, like say Whole Foods or Starbucks or General Motors, the owners are the shareholders. It's controlled by a board of directors and the users are the general public. Those are all distinct roles. And in the last image, shows in a cooperative that in a, in a member-owned cooperative, the members own the business, they control the business through their election of the board of directors, and they use the business. So it brings all three functions under the same uh, group of people. Some other things that are unique about a cooperative business is that the owners own the business on a democratic basis one member, one vote. That's distinct from um, a, a, an investor-owned corporation where the people who have the most invested have the most uh, greatest amount of control. Cooperative is a democratic structure. 
The next distinction is that a member's share of the benefit is based on how much they use the cooperative rather than how much they've invested. So the more one uses the co-op, the more one benefits. The third is that co-op owners seek mutual benefit. No one should really benefit in a co-op at the expense of another. In these economic times that we're in, where we've seen what, what the excesses of capitalism can bring in a society, I think it's really um, good to be a part of a system, a cooperative system, that looks to find mutual benefits, that um, looks at everybody's interests and, and uh, tries to find mutual benefits rather than trying to see who can win or accumulate the most. I think co cooperatives can very much be a part of the solution to some of the problems that we're facing today. The next unique feature of cooperative ownership is that members benefit both economically and socially. And through their elected board of directors, they allocate annual surpluses uh, depending on what their interests are. Michael, do we have any questions at this point? Um, Questions that don't quite pertain to the uh, general topic that you're on right now, so I'm going to hold off a little bit and see if it comes up later. Okay, sounds good. I look forward to taking that when we get there. Uh, the next slide I have up on the screen is the uh, third of the seven cooperative principles, the one on member economic participation. And uh, the cooperative principles were uh, are developed by the International Cooperative Association. This current version was adopted in uh, the mid-1990s, and uh, there, there were some changes uh, from the previous version, and one of them was related to this third principle, member economic participation. Uh, these cooperative principles are principles that guide cooperatives all around the world, and if you haven't had a chance to look at the full set of principles, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, you can find those at ICA.coop. The third principle says that members contribute equitably to and democratically control the capital of the cooperative. In the next part of the seminar, we're going to talk a little bit more about accumulating that capital. Um, at least part of that capital is usually the common property of the co-op, and the members receive limited, if any, uh, compensation on that capital. In other words, people don't invest in a cooperative for the purpose of accumulating um, wealth or uh, accumulating a dividend on their investment. People invest in a cooperative because they want to use the services of the cooperative, and they see that it's in their interest to invest in the cooperative because the cooperative is meeting their needs. The last part of the uh, cooperative principle is that members allocate surpluses for any of the following purposes either developing the cooperative, benefiting the members in proportion to their transactions, or supporting other activities approved by the membership. So that's the principle. Uh, now looking at how that, um, there we go. Uh, looking at um, why members invest capital, as I mentioned, because they they want to use the co-op and they trust that investing in the co-op will be in their own interest as well as the interest of other members. And cooperatives earn and keep this trust when members perceive that the co-op is an effective agent for meeting their needs, is dedicated to serving their needs, and is not out to serve any other, any other um, interest groups but is serving the members' needs. Uh, this would be another time I uh, pause to uh, see if there are any questions on this section about ownership. Well, there's a question here. I think it's a really interesting one about um, so between the time, uh, say for a startup here, which is what we're talking about, between the time the owners originally invest their share and before the store opens, what does participation mean, whether it's economic or other? probably going to vary quite a lot per group. Um, certainly the economic participation is is buying the, the member share and um, 
and waiting while the co-op gets organized so that they, they can begin shopping. Um, there are other kinds of participation, um, whether it's uh, participating in and communicating with the board of directors and the leaders, uh, letting people know what their needs and interests are, um, staying in touch with the cooperative, uh, making sure that it's staying on course, um, and uh, uh, communication is probably the most important kind of participation at, at the early startup stages. Um, Bruce or, or Crystal, uh, any comments that you'd like to add on uh, looking at just ownership and cooperative ownership compared to uh, other kinds of ownership? No, I don't think I have anything to add. No, and here's one more that just came in. I think it's kind of related to what you were talking about. So the question is, what could some of the other activities be to invest the surplus in? Um, so you were, you were talking about uh, members and investors surplus. So are you talking about some community or charity contributions? No, not necessarily, although that's possible. I'd be talking about um, expanding the services of the, of the cooperative if the members have other needs that they would like to see uh, the co-op provide them with. Uh, that would be a, a possibility. It certainly is possible that surplus can be, can be dedicated uh, to charitable activities. Um, I don't want to emphasize that today because the nature of the startup co-ops is that the most important thing is for you to generate surplus. And it very likely is going to take you a few years to be able to, to uh, be consistently generating surplus. Then chances are you're going to have a high amount of debt to repay. Um, and so the surplus is going to be useful for repaying debt. So for the um, the principle was written for cooperatives that may have existed for uh, 50 or 100 years or more. Uh, so it, it, it allows for other kinds of investments, but since we're focused today on startups, I really want to want to emphasize the using the surplus to strengthen the co-op, repay the debt uh, as your first priorities, eventually returning surplus to members. And then once you've accomplished all that, if you still are having surplus, uh, then you can get into what kinds of, of charitable organizations you may want to support. And, and Marilyn, I do have a, a, an addition now, just to emphasize to everybody that uh, that a cooperative is a business that is operating uh, for profit. It is not a nonprofit. Uh, the co-ops are often referred to as as nonprofits, but that's primarily because in many traditional co-ops, all of their income is allocated to the members, but they are still generating a profit and they're retaining a part of that allocation to capitalize the business. Uh, but it's important for people who are new to co-ops to realize that, that this is not a nonprofit, although it has some similarities to it. Thank you, Bruce. And this is Crystal. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I just also wanted to add that I think it's especially important for startups, you know, the whole idea for customer service not to over-promise and then under-deliver. I think it's important to stress the member responsibilities that come along with um, membership in a co-op and to not go right to that 35-year vision of, of you know, 100% of those patronage rebates getting put out into the community because I think um, anything can happen really quickly where that money really does need to be retained by the co-op. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate that. I think the under-promise, over-deliver is a, is a, a really um, interesting challenge for startup groups because you do need to, to um, a attract members and um, help them see that the co-op will provide benefits for them. But you also have to be very, very realistic about what um, how soon that will be, what kind of benefits will, will be initially, and what kind of benefits you have envisioned over the first few years. Um, but, but do be careful about over-promising things that you, you can't deliver and don't want to create disappointment. Hey, Marilyn, okay. there's just a bunch of questions. Can I just toss out two real quick that I think you could answer just before you move on? Okay. Um, one is about language, a question about the term member or owner and that you've been using both, and is there any difference really in the meaning? Uh, and the second is a little more about substance. <coughs> I'm sorry, someone is asking about, you're talking about generating surplus, and, and the question is, well, where does the surplus come from? Okay. 
Um, member owner, uh, I use both terms and I use them in, intentionally. Uh, they are, in my mind, they refer to the, the same function, the individual um, person who has uh, purchased a share in the cooperative, it's either a member or an owner. Different co-ops use different terms. Um, I don't think there's a, um, a right or wrong answer to the question. I do think it's important once you decide what term you're using to use that term consistently. Uh, Crystal, just uh, what do you use at Menominee? Actually, we, um, for our first 34 years, we used the word member. And um, I think as more and more places started having memberships like Sam's Club and whatnot, um, when we decided to get rid of our discounts at the register and move towards the patronage rebate system, we kind of purposely started using the word owner more because I, I feel like it conveys a little bit more about that member responsibility piece. Um, so we have gone with the clumsy member owner, member dash owner, and we use that on our signage. I think our um, front end staff still pretty much uses member when they're talking about membership in the co-op. We, we use the word membership and not ownership. Um, but I do think, I would, I would also recommend that you kind of pick one and stick with it. Okay, good. On the question of uh, surplus, uh, what I mean by surplus is uh, annual income through sales minus annual expenses, the cost of, of the food that you sold and all the operating expenses um, and the, once you subtract all the expenses from sales, the, what's left is the surplus. So moving on to the next um, section on member shares. Um, member shares is the tool by which member owners provide the capital to invest in their business. A member share program has two main goals. One is to provide the capital, uh, the co-op with an adequate capital base, and two is to create that sense of ownership among the members. There are different kinds of capital uh, for a cooperative. What we're going to focus on today is member share capital, the capital that is invested by members. Um, the, the advantage of that is that that it is not taxable uh, to the co-op. It, it can be low cost and interest free. Uh, accumulating member capital allows a, a cooperative to leverage debt capital. So if you, if you needed to borrow some money uh, to get your co-op started, the, the bank or the lending institution would look at what have the owners invested. So if the owners have invested a, a good portion, a third to a half of the money that you need, uh, you have a greater chance that a bank or a lending institution would be willing to invest the rest of the money that you need. The advantage in a cooperative is that many people can provide a relatively small amount that can add up to a significant base of funds. And the last advantage of member capital is it demonstrates member support. If you're having trouble raising member capital, if you don't have enough people who want to invest capital in the cooperative, um, it's uh, caught, uh, an indicator that you may not have enough members who will bring enough loyalty that the co-op will be successful. So it's a good test to see if you uh, really have uh, people in your community that want to co-op, that want to co-op enough to invest some capital in that cooperative. Continuing with member shares, um, member shares two, we're we're looking that um, for that member share investment, we want to be sure that it it does um, accumulate an adequate capital base. So when you're thinking about the share amount, you want to think about uh, what is the capital that we need, how many members might we expect to attract, and dividing uh, that one number into the other, you'll get uh, an amount that is that that the co-op will need per member in order to capitalize the co-op. Some other advice on your, your share amount is to keep it flexible as the needs of the business change. Never use the term lifetime or promise people that this is the capital amount the co-op needs from members forever. It's just the capital amount that your co-op needs from its members today. It's very likely that five years from now or ten years from now, uh, the amount of, the, of 
capital that the co-op needs per member will increase. And you want to make sure that your, your communication, your bylaws, and your structure allow you to increase the amount of capital that you need per member over time. Um, I'm going to go back up. I didn't mean to click forward on that slide. There we go. I also want to be sure that your member equity is structured so that it is not subject to securities laws or taxation. You want to, uh, the details of that are a little beyond what we can cover today, but you want to be sure and work with an accountant and an attorney to be sure that you're exempt from those laws and taxation. Uh, next, we recommend that the member share investment be the same for each membership, whether that membership is held by an individual or a household or a business. Uh, a member is a member is a member, and a member share amount um, we recommend is the same per member. Now, it's very likely that you'll have members with different economic means and different abilities to pay. And to accommodate those members, we suggest uh, creating a payment plan uh, so that members who have, have fewer resources can make their equity payments over time, um, but eventually they'll accumulate the same amount of equity uh, in the co-op as someone who's able to pay it all at once. Next thing on, on uh, equity is for that equity to be refundable to the member if they no longer want to use the co-op. We recommend that you create structures where that the refundable nature of that is subject to board approval so that if, if there's a, a reason that the co-op is unable to return that equity, it, it would hurt the, um, the co-op or make the co-op insolvent that you would not return equity, um, but that it would, it would be refundable under normal circumstances if all is well. When you're designing your program, remember that it should be simple and easy to administer, should be fair, uh, discourage cheating, minimize any administrative fees, and uh, is only changed with member understanding and support. So I talked earlier about the need for it to be flexible, to be able to change over time. Um, I stand fully behind that. In this section, I'm just saying that you wouldn't want to make that change unless the members understood why and were supportive of that reason. If they saw that the capital needs of the co-op had changed or the co-op wanted to add features that it didn't have before and the members were interested in having those features, say a, a deli or a cafe, um, that you could increase the, the capital if, if the members were supportive, <coughs> excuse me, supportive of that kind of change. Chris, I wonder if you'd tell us a little bit about the, um, how the Menominee Co-op has structured its member capital. Uh, sure. Right now, our, um, uh, we have a uh, $100 membership. And uh, uh, like you said in the notes, it's the same whether you're an individual or a business or a household. Um, it hasn't changed in a really long time. Way back in the day, we had way more options and it was definitely a lot to administer so we've kind of streamlined it over time um, and the way it's set up legally in our bylaws um, when you pay the hundred dollars you are actually buying one class a share for twenty five dollars which is your voting right and then three class b shares for twenty five dollars each which are non-voting stock shares um, you can get your money back, but we do have um, that in our bylaws that it's you know that the board of directors can vote otherwise um, in keeping the best interests of the co-op in mind. Um, and right now we have you can either pay it all at once or you can pay um, in four installments over the course of the year. And if you do that, it's an additional five dollars for each of those installments. Um, we thought that was going to hurt our uh, membership when we changed that. We used to have it be free um, and they could do it over four years, um, but we realized that that was uh, allowing a lot of people not to complete their memberships. 
Um, when we changed it, what really ended up happening was probably 95% of our new members are just paying the full 100, and we are getting more members than ever. So it doesn't seem like that um, prevented it for too many people. Oh, good. Good. And Bruce, feel free to jump in anytime you'd like to add anything. Um, I want to move ahead to thinking about how much equity and on this slide, we talk about thinking strategically about the cooperative's capital needs. And the workshop that Bill is going to do next week will, will be looking at how do you set up uh, sources and uses um, budget for your cooperative. So what, what kind of, of money will you need to raise? How much will you need to have? What will the uses of that money be? And then what will the sources of that be? So our, our webinar today will tie nicely into that. Uh, you'll have an idea after you go through that exercise of what the total needs are. So in, in looking at that long-term um, capital plan, um, you, you'll then want to, to base the member's equity requirement on that capital plan. One option that many uh, cooperatives are looking at now is an annual equity investment uh, rather than um, a, a set amount that people pay up to. Uh, that, uh, especially for new co-ops, I think that can be advantageous to be able to continually build equity, and it may make it easier for members to understand it and afford it, too. Uh, you can always stop accumulating equity at some point if you find you have more equity than you need. Um, but this kind of ongoing equity contribution um, may really help you get through the first few years. I want to give a little bit of a, an example here. Ma'am, uh, before you go too far, I just want to check. There's a number of questions coming up. Are you going to have a moment to respond in a minute? Yeah, let me get through this example and see if that answers some of those questions. Okay, great. And then, and then we'll take it. All righty. Um, in, this, in this example, the the new community food co-op needs a million dollars in capital to open their successful food store. And generally, 30 to 50 percent of that will need to come from member owners, so that'd be 300 to 500 thousand dollars. After you've worked on your sources and uses budget, you might see that the member owner's portion of that could come from three sources, some for member equity uh, and some for member loans, and the remaining would come from debt. And let's say your feasibility study projects that you'll have 1,600 people who will join uh, before you open and another 1,000 in the first year or two. So you take that money that you need to raise from member capital uh, of a quarter of a million, divide it by those 1,600 members, and that comes up to about $150 per member. Now, if your co-op needs $2 million to get started instead of one, you'll just need to go through the calculation again and uh, based on the number of uh, the amount of equity that you need. Or if you are projecting a, a higher or lower number of uh, expected members, you would need to adjust that amount as well. So Michael, I think I will stop there and, um, and uh, take uh, any, what, what questions you have right now. I, I think one of them you just answered with the example, so it was a good call. Yep. Um, there's a couple others that have come up here. Um, one is about uh, business shares and voting rights in a co-op. How do you handle that? Uh, and the other that is maybe somewhat related uh, in terms of legalities are member shares. Is that amount sometimes limited by state law? There's a couple to start with, and there's a couple more out of that. Okay. Uh, each member has one vote. So if that um, if that membership is owned by a business or a corporation, that um, business or corporation needs to tell the co-op who is going to be authorized to cast the vote for that membership. Same with a household. If there's a family of people that are uh, joining and using the co-op and, and purchasing under one membership, uh, they will need to identify who has the authority uh, to make decisions on that member share and cast that vote. Uh, the next question, I'm sorry, I didn't write it down and I forget what it was. It is about, um, is the amount of member shares that's sometimes limited by state law? 
not that I know of. Bruce, do you have any information on that? Uh, I have not seen any limitations on that. All right. And here's a couple more. Um, well, let's see if I can click on them again here so I can read the whole thing. Uh, one was about if a member moves out of state, uh, do you have to refund the, uh, the amount? Um, I would state it as, yes, you would want to refund the amount. If the member leaves and no longer wants to use the co-op, you would want to refund their, their share amount. You want the co-op to be owned by the people who are using it. Now, again, that's subject to discretion of the board so that if the, if the co-op is not in a position, uh, if it would be insolvent, if it would put the co-op at risk to refund shares, then no. Uh, but that member who's moved away and requested their equity back would be put on a list. And as soon as equity is available to be refunded, uh, they would be first in line. And I might just echo, this is Crystal, that um, keeping that membership list as tight and accurate as possible is very smart when going into a patronage rebate. We had 35 years of uh, loose, at best, record keeping. And um, it really was a big process to go through and figure out who did we need to inactivate because they had not li lived up to their share of the bargain by keeping their address current with us, for example. Um, and who, so cleaning up that list was a really arduous task for us. And so if you can just keep on it as you go forward, I think that's easier when it comes time to write out patronage rebate checks. Thank you, and I think that's really a, a, a good um, addition to the answer to the question that if, if people are no longer using the co-op, you really do want to keep your membership clean and, and, uh, and encourage people to request their equity back when they're no longer able to, move, to use the co-op, whether they, they move away or whether they just don't want to use the co-op anymore. Have another question, Michael? Oh, yeah, there's a few more here. Um, this goes back to something you said earlier about trying to set up a program uh, that um, is fair, that is not uh, easy to cheat on or something to that effect. And someone said, well, you know, maybe they're naive, but how can you cheat on a membership? What is, what is it you're referring to? Crystal, do you have any examples? Uh, we had all kinds of examples when we were at a discount structure at the register, you know, people using someone else's number in order to get their discount or um, many households trying to use one membership to get a larger discount. Um, I think when it's patron when you have a patronage rebate system and you're not giving away the store at the registers, that might be biased, um, then I think it maybe is a little trickier. Um, I would say that just going back to something that Marilyn said about each each household gets one vote, I think it's best to say each membership gets one vote. Um, we do, in our co-op, have several households that carry more than one membership because they each want to vote. You know, a husband and wife or two people and a couple both want to be able to have a say about who their board, who's on their board and the big decisions that are made. So they have, you know, purchased an additional membership and they might shop under just one of them to keep the books easier, but then, you know, they each have their distinct member number and vote. That's kind of a separate add-on. Yeah, good, thanks. And that, that is um, the primary issue uh, with discounts. It's, it's one of the reasons that we don't recommend discounts. It's one of many reasons that we don't recommend everyday discounts, but one of those is that it, it reduces the uh, likelihood that people will try to cheat. Yeah, and actually just yesterday a customer suggested to one of my cashiers that she just ring up all the non-member sales under her number so she would get a really big patronage rebate check. Um, I'm really glad you suggested it to a very honest young woman, but um, I suppose that would be a possibility for a way to cheat if you were a staff member and you were uh, racking up other people's purchases on your account. So many things I've just never thought of before. I know. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was news to me. <laughs> Here's a couple more questions that are very much related, Marilyn, and, and one is a little bit more specific in the way it's phrased, so I'll, I'll just read that one. Um, so the question is about business memberships and should they be structured differently or cost differently? Um, and this person asks, so if they're, if they're going to be more work to maintain um, than because of the processing or whatever it might be, should it cost more for a business to be a member? 
uh, I'm going to just give you my personal opinion, and that is no, uh, that every membership, every every member, um, should be the same amount. Uh, there's a very, uh, you're, you're right, there's a minor process in the, in the voting procedure that uh, on the application form, the, um, a business owner uh, would, would need to indicate who is authorized to vote. Uh, but I don't think that's an owner's burden. And um, I think that it makes a lot more sense to be able to, to talk about and be true to the idea of, of democracy, that each member has one vote, each each member has paid one uh, share, has purchased one share, or however your shares are structured. As Crystal mentioned, there's there's a variety of ways those can be, be structured, but that the the um, the fair share is divided by the number of members, and that each member has the same fair share requirement for equity. Good, and then just as a general one, um, as the needs of the business change, um, who's responsible for making changes in equity uh, requirements and so forth? It would be a, the leadership of the cooperative, usually the general manager and the board of directors together would be looking at their long-term plan, looking at the capital needs of the co-op, and uh, looking at their, their membership. And uh, the board and the manager would be, would be uh, doing some strategic thinking around that and, um, and uh, presenting their ideas to the membership to, to um, explain, communicate, see if they have support for that kind of a change. I think Michael will stop right there with the questions for now. Uh, I want to uh, keep going, and hopefully there will be more on the next sections as we go along. Great. Um, we want to look at um, having a communication plan for your member equity, and, and want to be sure that it communicates ownership, uh, that it talks about investment, that the the money that actually um, belongs to the member, but they're investing it in the co-op so that the co-op can better meet that member's needs. Uh, want to value that the um, investment helps to create a cooperative economy, and it helps that helps to uh, strengthen the community and serve the member's needs. You want to communicate fair share, that the amount of the uh, equity that's required for each member is their fair share of the total equity that's required to make this business that we all own together work. It's, it's one of all of us coming together to create something that we want, and uh, this is what each person's fair share amount is. Um, now, next week on the Sources and Uses webinar, Bill's going to bring in the idea of member loans. If there are people who are able to contribute more, that's fine, and the, and the co-op certainly needs that. But those aren't ownership shares. That's a, a different instrument, and those um, are handled differently. Consistency, we mentioned before, uh, whatever terms you use, use them consistently, and uh, flexibility, uh, reserving the right for the capital requirements to change as the capital needs of the co-op change. And speaking of uh, flexibility in language, I just want to touch a little bit on um, being careful about the terms that you use, uh, being sure that you're using terms that indicate investment in the cooperative, terms like share or your share, investment, your investment. Um, those are, are better terms than inaccurate terms like pay or cost or price or fee. Um, when you're talking about equity, those really aren't accurate terms. And I educate members that they are really truly owners of the cooperative. Most of us haven't grown up with the experience of owning a business with uh, hundreds or thousands of other people. And uh, so it takes a while for us to get used to what that means. And, and you as co-op leaders can really help by being consistent and clear in your language and in your thinking about what a cooperative ownership really means. And then the uh, last thing on this slide is focusing the, um, uh, on the annual investment and the co-op's current capital needs that um, that's being clear that that the co-op has, has, and it may need to change the capital requirement over time, but this is the current capital need. 
and that this is the amount of annual investment uh, that we would need right now in order to get going. Uh, some co-ops have an incentive or a thank you for any member who brings their share up to the full amount. Uh, Crystal described that with um, uh, there's a, a fee that's added on if, if people use the payment plan. Um, just a quick word on fees and dues. Uh, those uh, do not represent real ownership and are not and should not be used in a cooperative structure. You're, we're talking about member equity capital investments, if they're not fees, they're not dues, they're not taxable to this business. Uh, that would be the end of what I wanted to say about share investments. Um, Crystal or Bruce, anything you want to add while we're taking uh, any more questions in this section? I'm th I think I'm good. I would echo that I agree that um, a business membership should be treated the same as an individual one. Um, but for the sake of cooperation, if anybody's interested in um, a co-op that does it differently, uh, I know Viroqua Food Co-op in Viroqua, Wisconsin, um, the general manager there, Jan, d does have a, a different structure and um, it's a really small town and they do some extra help for small businesses that are getting started. Um, and so she, and she's a really careful person, so she would probably have some advice or share her experience about how that's worked for her. Great, thanks. There are a couple of uh, places to find lists of co-ops. So one is the cooperativegrocers.coop. Um, they have a list of food co-ops and so does the NCGA website, National Cooperative Grocers Association. And I would encourage um, all the folks on this call to peruse those lists and click on the websites of some different co-ops. There's a lot of different ways uh, that different co-ops use these systems. Um, I've taken, I've been doing this work for about 30 years now and have tried to take the best of what I find and put it together in what I think is a, is a good system, but you'll see a lot of variety in how co-ops actually implement these systems. Michael, any other question now before we move into uh, benefits and patronage refunds? Sure. Um, so there's a couple here. Um, one is about if you're, if you're, um, Say a startup, you're trying to bring in member owners, and then you're thinking about raising the the share, the cost of a share. Um, is that easy or hard to do to get members to accept that? It's pretty hard to do. I would um, hope that you would be in your in your startup phase that you would be looking at least five years forward and and looking at what your capital needs will be over the the first five years, so that you you either would set up your investment at the beginning to be an ongoing every year contribution of equity or to be an amount large enough that it will sustain you over the first several years. Um, while I am a strong advocate of keeping it, um, keeping it uh, flexible and having the ability to increase the, the share amount as the capital needs of the co-op increase, um, I also think that you should look long term and you shouldn't, it, it's not wise to be changing that um, too frequently. Um, in my opinion, you ought to look at every five years, a co-op ought to look at its capital investment and see if it needs to change. Uh, but more frequently than that um, might be, um, might make the members think that the leaders aren't um, planning carefully. And, and I would just add a, a general comment related to that is that it's hard to raise equity in a co-op. And so you need to be conservative with your capital structure. In many businesses, you know, there's an owner and they're willing to put in more money or mortgage their house or whatever needs to happen to raise capital if something is suddenly needed. But in a co-op, uh, it's not easy. You have to change your, your share structure or you have to start up a member loan program or you have to go to a bank which may not understand uh, your structure. So it's important to be conservative and, and as Marilyn said, to think ahead on your equity. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, are you up for a couple more questions? Yeah, I think we can take uh, two or three minutes worth. So one is just about terminology, the difference between the terms shares, securities uh, versus member equity. What's the difference there? Hey, hey Bruce, could you take that one? 
Uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? On, well, it, it's the, the, uh, just trying to distinguish the terms share, securities, and member equity. Um, well, they're all, um, they all could mean more or less the same thing. That you know, when you have member shares, they are a form of member's equity. There are other, other things that can be forms of member equity besides shares. Uh, securities just refers to individual items. Um, and typically, you're trying to avoid the, the overall generic securities laws, so you want to make sure you're talking to an attorney about that. Um, but sh shares and equity are, are more or less interchangeable. Um, here's a, uh, one that came out a while ago. It's, it's just sort of related to the, the economic structure of a co-op. Can co-ops have volunteers? You want to be very careful about volunteers um, because uh, of the Fair Labor Standards laws. And um, just given that that's a, a whole big question that goes beyond the scope of, of economic participation, I, I don't want to go into that too much right now. Uh, Cooperative Grocer has some good uh, articles on it, the historic articles on that question. Um, certainly, um, a co-op, particularly in the startup phase, will need people who are who are contributing their leadership skills, their time, and their effort in order to get it going. Once the, once the co-op is open and the store is open, I recommend uh, having um, paid staff uh, providing the functions of the, of the cooperative and not relying on, on volunteer, um, in part because I think a co-op is a business and should be able to meet its business needs. Uh, jobs are important in our economy. It's important to pay people well for the work that they do. And lastly, uh, being careful about the, um, the problems related to volunteer labor in a store and the and Fair Labor Standards Act. So with that, I think, uh, Michael, we should probably move on uh, to the um, economic benefit side. We've been talking about the ownership side, the investment side, and now we want to look a little bit about the other side of the coin the economic benefits to members uh, for um, their participation, their investment in the cooperative. You know, as we talked about before, the most important reason that people invest in a cooperative is because they want to use it. They want the cooperative to be there. They, in our case, as food co-ops, they want to shop there. Um, they want to participate in a community-owned um, grocery store that's designed to meet their needs. Um, so that's the primary benefit, is the store itself. And for startups, that may be the only benefit for members uh, for many years un until uh, you're, you've achieved profitability, where you have surplus. Um, it's more important to have the co-op be stable and to generate surplus than it is to uh, provide um, additional benefits to members besides the store being open. Um, but as you look longer term in your planning, I do want to, to share with you the, the tool that most cooperatives use. Um, more and more cooperatives are using the, the patronage refund structure as a way of returning uh, surplus benefits to the member shoppers. The goal with benefits is to have benefits that the members love and that strengthen and sustain the co-op. For members to uh, love the benefit plan, they need to see and value the benefits that the co-op provides them just by its existence. That's one thing that in, in many ways it will be easier for startup groups to accomplish um, a co-op like Crystal's that's been around for 35 years. It's hard for those members in, that, in Menominee, Wisconsin to remember what it was like 35 years ago when they didn't have a co-op food store. So they, the second and third generations of co-op members usually don't appreciate the co-op quite as much as the founding members and the first members who remember what it was like before they had a co-op. Uh, patronage refunds are an economic benefit that members uh, love and that strengthen and sustain the co-op. Why patronage refunds? Well, they create a mutually beneficial relationship with the member owners. When the co-op prospers, the members prosper. So members want the co-op to prosper. The co-op wants the members to prosper. It creates this mutually uh, beneficial relationship. The members can trust that the co-op isn't profiting off of their business. 
um, because they know that any surplus that the co-op is able to generate will be returned to them um, on a por in proportion to their business. And it engages people. It, it, they pay attention to uh, how, how well the co-op is doing. They look more carefully at the, at the annual report to see if the co-op is doing well um, when they are looking for that. That's the way that they receive their benefits. It also makes use of a cooperative advantage. The Internal Revenue Service Tax Code was, was, has been structured that allows the, the co-op, because it, it has the, the features of um, operating at, at cost that Bruce talked about early on, uh, so that those, um, those profits aren't taxed at the co-op level if they're returned uh, to the members. The patronage refunds also allow more money to stay in the, in the community, pay less in taxes, keep more money locally. It reduces the co-op's um, uh, cash outlays as well. And I think it creates an appropriate pressure to generate profit. That a co-op should, uh, should generate profit. Uh, the question, the big difference in a co-op is what happens to that profit. But without profit, uh, over time, we won't be successful, we won't survive, we won't be able to pay our employees uh, appropriately, and eventually we, we won't exist at all. So profit is good, um, and having patronage refunds helps create attention on profit and the accumulation of profit. Looking at some of the, the benefits of patronage refunds, it's, it's a responsible way of returning the surplus to owners. It's sustainable uh, because you're not returning more than you have. Even if all the customers are members, it's sustainable, again, because you're not, not um, returning more than you have. It protects the co-op against lean years. If, you're, if the co-op isn't profitable, uh, you haven't committed that you're going to return some benefit to members that you don't have. Um, Unlike a discount at the register structure, which, which many co-ops used to do, but are, are finally realizing that it's, it's not sustainable and it's not a good idea, um, discounts at the register give away profits before you've earned them and can put the co-op at risk. I've seen a lot of co-ops go out of business from excessive discounts given away and uh, instead of relying on sharing the excess with the owners. For the members, it provides a fair return on their investment. Uh, remember that the equity that they invested is theirs, assuming that the co-op is solvent and able to return that um, investment when they wish to leave the co-op. So thinking of it in terms of comparing it to if, if say, your equity requirement is um, $100, like in Crystal's case, or maybe $200 or more, um, thinking about what would be a fair return on that Think about it in terms of what if you put that money into a, a bank account, a savings account at a bank or a checking account. Well, what benefit would you expect to earn on that investment over the course of a year? You know, maybe a few dollars, um, particularly at today's interest rate. And, and so the, the benefit, again, the primary benefit to the member is the fact that the co-op exists. I also want to give them a fair and reasonable return on their investment. But it shouldn't be excessive. It shouldn't be uh, a speculative kind of benefit on, on their relatively small investment. Marilyn, can I add one thing to that? Sure. Um, I think another thing about the discounts, um, you know, like I said, we just made this conversion. So we had many, many years of discounts that absolutely paralyzed us. And um, at the end of every year, we would look at our books and see, oh, we gave away $42,000 in discounts and our profits for the year were minus $37,000. So um, it was getting worse and worse every year. And has, we've just had a remarkable financial turnaround in just one year of making, or two years of making that change. Um, but another point about discounts, in addition to the things that Marilyn mentioned, is that they're also, I think, a pretty unfair distribution back to the membership. We had a real small number of members that got really savvy about how to use their discounts. and. Um, that total amount of money that we gave away was not distributed according to all the members and what they spent over the course of the year. Um, and I think that's another thing that harkens all the way back to the beginning of the 
webinar when, when you were talking about um, no one member should benefit at the expense of any other member. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. good. So let's talk a little bit about um, how patronage refunds work. And um, this is the, the section that I'm especially appreciative that Bruce was able to join us on um, in an area of, of his expertise. Um, I'll give the highlights, Bruce, but I welcome you to, to, to jump in and expand on it at any time. The uh, Internal Revenue Service rules, which are in subchapter T of the Internal Revenue Service, formalizes the procedure of how uh, those must, of what has to be followed in order to um, to get the, the tax benefit, to have the tax deduction for the, the patronage dividend. The Internal Revenue Service is not very flexible. These rules have to be followed precisely. Uh, so be very careful that you know and understand them. They're not very long. Um, there's not a lot of, there's, I think, five subparts to the uh, rules, but they do have to be, um, have to be handled precisely. Um, first of all, you, you have to operate on a cooperative basis. Um, next, you have to have a pre-existing obligation that it, usually it's contained in the bylaws. It's an agreement with the members that surplus does belong to them as owners. Um, if the co-op has 85% of its sales to people who are going to use the co-op for their, their personal use, then uh, you can um, uh, file the form 3491 and then, um, then you don't have to send out the 1099 uh, patronage forms. Uh, this will save a lot of paperwork, so be sure and, and file that um, that paperwork. Most of our consumer food co-ops, most of the people are buying food for their own consumption. Um, then at the end of the year, you look at the uh, patronage net earnings. Uh, you look at the after uh, calculating your total income sales, subtracting all the expenses. Uh, the, the result is the surplus or the net income. And the first thing you have to do is divide that between member and non-member business um, so that uh, you know which is patronage based. Uh, most co-ops have um, uh, patronage refunds available only to members on members business. So we're, we're going to uh, proceed with the assumption that that is, is the way that you'll handle it. Um, then you look at what percent of the total member sales did each member purchase. And that would be their percentage of the earnings. The co-op will owe taxes on any patronage, uh, on, the, on the net profit for any patronage from non-members. The last uh, of the um, IRS rules that I want to focus on right here is the, uh, the distribution. Um, once you divide the, the, the surplus amongst all the members based on their purchases, uh, that total amount is, is tax exempt to the co-op, assuming you followed all the rules, including the rule that you must distribute in cash or store credit at least 20% of, um, of, their, of their portion. This uh, flow chart here shows a little bit of how it works. Um, uh, basically, the uh, I just have gone through all of this, and so um, Bruce, I want to see if you want to have you want to add anything at this time. No, I think that that's a very good summary. Uh, as startup co-ops, obviously you're not too worried about giving out patronage yet, but you do want to set up the system and be able to to uh, be ready to do it. Know, in the future when you do have uh, profits that you don't necessarily want to pay tax on and you want to have your members share in. Good. Thank you. Uh, Michael, do we have any uh, questions at this point? Um, well, there's one that seems to relate to something you were saying earlier um, about patronage refunds can reduce the cooperative's cash outlay. So someone asks, well, how does it do that since it really is a cash disbursement? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, let's look on this slide that we have up here right now, the flow chart. And 
in this portion here, the it looks at the distribution. Um, the minimum is is 20 percent, and that is the most common approach that the co-op distributes 20 percent of the refund to the member, but retains 80 percent. And if you do that, uh, you've retained, you've kept more cash. You've kept 80 percent of the cash um, on hand. I might want to look ahead at this next uh, table, jumping ahead a little bit. Um, but this shows some of the, the tax savings. Uh, this is a table, of Bruce, that you actually um, created. It was in your in your uh, co -op, was it co -op brochure article or your CCNA presentation? Uh, it was the presentation. Yeah, yeah. Um, you might want to walk walk people through this a little bit so they can see how the, the this question about how the cash. How the co-op retain some of the cash? Would you mind? Sure, I can do that. Basically, the, the way the chart works is that you have uh, uh, the left the left hand side is is the total on, on the various things, and then on the right hand, the right two columns are the profits on the member sales and the non-member sales. So it's allocating, and it basically uh, goes through and you start out on the top, you've made $100,000, and then you're dividing it out. Say the members are 75% of your sales, and the, so the non-members are 25%. And then you look at allocating the, uh, the $75,000. Now, normally, uh, you won't allocate to everybody because some, some people's purchases were so small that it doesn't make sense for you to allocate to them one, one penny of, uh, of patronage equity. So normally, uh, you're allocating less than the entire amount of profit to the members, and that's why there's $70,000 there. And then it goes through and shows how much tax is paid, because you have to pay tax on all of the non-member sale profit, and then the little bit of member sale profit that you're not allocating. And then what you have left out of the uh, $75,000, you've paid out $750 in tax, then the rest of it, it is allocated to members, but only 20% of the 70,000 actually gets paid to them in cash. And the rest of the other 80% you retain, and that becomes another form of member equity, uh, is retained patronage uh, allocations. And so then you pay, you pay cash on it, uh, you know, deciding, uh, let's see. So you pay out the 20% patronage, and then you can compare the cash outlay between whether you gave out patronage or not. And you can see the second line up from the bottom that, that the cash outlay, if you didn't give any uh, patronage, was 22500 And if you do give out the patronage, it's actually slightly less. Now, someday down the road, you owe the rest of that, uh, the $70,000 minus the, the $14,000, the 80% share. Eventually, you'll pay that back. But you can wait a long time to do that and, and rotate it back slowly over many years. That's an excellent graph. Bruce, can I ask a question that came up that's related to what you were just talking about? Um, so when a member leaves the co-op, their 80, that 80% 80 portion that's in their name in the co-op, can they just request that when they leave the co-op, or does that somehow the, the co-op still controls that in another way? Uh, it, it's similar to member equity in that the, the board always has to reserve the right not to give the patronage back. And in fact, what uh, many cooperatives do is that they would treat that as a whole separate set of equity and that they would not pay back to anybody until they decide someday in the future oh, we're going to start revolving back our equity and we're going to start with our 2008 uh, you know, retained share and start revolving that to everybody. So it could well be that somebody leaves the co-op, you decide to pay them back, they're, they're paid in $100 or $200 uh, as their, their member share. But then that you would say, well, we're not going to pay back this, this other patronage share because you know, we're not going to retain, return that until someday in the future. So you need to keep in touch with us, and eventually uh, we may send you a check. Now, that said, there are also a few co-ops whose basic uh, approach is that they're never going to give that money, that 80% back. And the logic there is that your members don't pay tax on it. And so in essence, uh, what you're, you're doing is capitalizing the co-op 
uh, avoiding paying some, some tax on that portion of it, uh, but the member doesn't really, uh, you know, they, they don't have a strong claim on that money in a sense. So I, I don't recommend that, but some co-ops uh, have definitely taken that approach to patronage. I think for the startup groups, it, it uh, makes a lot of sense to to look long term and to, to not have a sh uh, an immediate plan for repaying that the 80 uh, percent. Certainly, if there's some point in the future where the co-op has more capital than it needs, um, it makes sense to put that money back in the hands of the members. But as long as the co-op is making use of the capital, is increasing its ability to serve more and more members and more needs of the members, uh, it may be quite some time before you'll be in a position that you have excess capital. Do we have another question, Michael? Uh, well, this one relates to that. Someone just trying to follow this train of thought along. Um, so say the next year, so you've given your, your patronage rebate one year, and the next year there's a, you have less of a profit, but you still want to give a patronage rebate. Would you then take some of that 80% you retained from a previous year and then give that out as a refund this year? Well, you certainly could do that. You could choose at any point in the future to be returning a portion of the 80%, but that wouldn't be uh, a current year allocation, and it's not affecting your taxes at all when you do that. And likely, if you're making less profit, you have less cash around uh, to be thinking about retiring uh, that title patronage dividend that you or patronage allocation that you've retained. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that in a year when the co-op didn't make as much profit, you you want to be honest with the members about that, and um, uh, explain why that might have been, and um, what their what that means to them as owners of the business. That if the co-op made less money, they they get less back, and uh, um, that's just part of helping um, them understand their role as owners of the cooperative, as co-owners, one of many, but still as owners. Um, one thing you can do, uh, certainly we've said that 20% is the minimum, and that's what, what most co-ops do, uh, distribute 20 and retain 80. Um, another, uh, another way that you can vary that amount is, is if it's a smaller profit than you had hoped for. If you have the ability, if you have the cash to do it, you can return a higher percentage, 30, 40, 50 percent, uh, and retain 50. But as Bruce says, you really want to be careful about doing that. If the, if the co-op wasn't uh, as profitable, maybe you, maybe it's a year you should return the, the minimum and not, not more than that. They're strategic decisions. They're not easy decisions, but uh, they're decisions you certainly want to look to on an annual basis with an eye towards your long-term vision. And more, Michael? Well, there's a few other questions that are kind of, they've come up throughout the presentation, so maybe I'll hold off until you get through, and at the end of this time, we'll bring those back up. Okay. Sounds good. Um, I've just gone back to this flow chart and looking at the different uh, decisions that you have to make. At the beginning here, net income, the dividing it between member, patronage, and non-member, uh, that's not a decision, that's a calculation. Uh, you can divide your net, net income between those. Uh, then in your uh, member source uh, net income, the, the decision here, you decide how much of that you want to allocate to members and how much is unallocated. Of course, you'll pay taxes on the unallocated portion that will flow into equity after it's taxed. And the next decision you have to make is here on the distribution, uh, how much of the allocated equity, uh, allocated retained um, patronage will you distribute. Again, the minimum is 20, um, but uh, you can choose a higher amount there. The next two slides just go through those decisions. Again, I'm not going to repeat those, but if you're, if you're downloading them and reading them separately, can uh, refer to that uh, flow chart as you're looking at these slides on the decision. So now we've talked about uh, patronage refunds, the primary way of returning surplus to members. Um, I want to just look briefly at other member benefits. Um, 
and co-op certainly can provide other tangible in, uh, benefits, both that provide an incentive uh, for people to join or as a way to increase their purchases or both. Uh, these, these would be supplemental. They might be particularly valuable to, uh, to startup co-ops if you're not expecting to have patronage refunds in the first few years. Um, they're generally management prerogatives. They're um, things like uh, specials, uh, special prices on certain products um, just for members, um, member-only coupons, member appreciation events, uh, special orders, things like that. They, you want to be careful as you're setting those up that they are sustainable and that they are flexible and can change over time, that you're not, and they're not promising anything. They're extras. They're not the primary return. Again, the primary return is that the store itself exists. Uh, next to that, the, the surplus is shared on a, on a usage basis. And then uh, if, there are, if there's other, other tangible benefits that can be provided, uh, those should be extras. Of course, there's also intangible benefits that, that people receive, their sense of belonging and, and pride and community about what can be accomplished. Um, Crystal, do you guys have some, in, some other uh, member benefits that you offer at Menominee? Uh, yeah, in addition to, like you said, the store itself and um, the sharing of the wealth at the end of the year, uh, we have member owner specials in the store every month. Um, there's probably about 75 to 100 items that we already receive on sale, and we pass the savings on only to our member owners. Um, we have case discounts for members only. If you order certain items by the case or by the six, you get a 10% discount off of the retail price. Uh, they get a free business listing in our business directory. Uh, they get the newsletter mailed to their home, you know, like, $20 extra on their check. They can cash a check for $20 more. Um, they can use uh, the declining balance feature on our POS system where they can pay in advance and then have credit at the register. Um, it's viewed as benefit to people, but it's actually obviously a big benefit to us because they're prepaying for their groceries. Um, I don't know, decreased ad prices in the newsletter. There's a lot of little things. Uh -huh. And you mentioned before that uh, you're your membership is growing, mm -hmm. even after, or especially after you've shifted to patronage uh, dividends. Yeah, we, for three years ago when we made the decision to make the switch, you know, we spent an entire year educating our current membership, and that's really what we focused on. Um, our store is just growing like crazy anyway for the last three years, so I think a lot of our membership has just been that sort of a natural part of our growth right now. Um, but we really focused on educating our current members about the change. And then we found, as a bonus, that after the first of the year rolled around and we instituted the change, that it was actually much easier to sell a membership because we didn't have to say you get 5% once a month, but if you do this, you get something different, and then the case and the member appreciation day. You know, we had all these numbers that we were talking about um, with prospective members and it just got a lot easier to talk about it and it, it sounded more like ownership in a business as opposed to a bunch of perks that you get from membership like you do at Sam's Club or someplace like that. So I think it got easier to sell memberships. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like easier to communicate the idea of ownership. Very much so, yeah. yeah. And you don't really want to create a situation where you're you're bribing people to, to join the co-op, or if you don't give them something that they they won't want to be a co-owner. Um, if that's true, then it really quest, you really have to question how how loyal are are they? How important is the co-op to them? And are you really creating a cooperative? Totally. And I'll say that, um, you know, we just put those checks out for the first time just a few weeks ago, and I, we were overwhelmed with positive reaction to them. And when we were making the checks, I thought, well, this is silly. People are getting a check for just $2, and they're going to get it and feel like it's not enough. But it was just incredible how many people took, like, a personal pride in it and an excitement about being part of something bigger. And you know, they could see that even though their check was small, it represented a much bigger, you know, we have 1,100 active members now, and so you do the math, and they realized it was making a pretty big impact in our community. I think I had 
two people call me with questions, math, kind of math questions, and one person upset that her check was as low as it was. But that um, was a great conversation. It opened up a, a bigger picture conversation about what she wants our co-op to be like in five years and how that's going to take a lot of money. Good. Hey, Crystal, is there a way you can give us a sense of um, a this is now a good specific example. You know, how many members got a patronage refund? How much profit did you have? How much did you distribute to your member owners? Is there a way to yeah. do that? Um, our profits were somewhere, maybe Bruce has a better memory than me, but they were somewhere around $42,000. So uh, about thirty to I think, $1,000 were um, attributable to our members. And we indeed uh, retained 80% of that and paid out 20. So I think, um, you know, we mentioned how you don't bother writing out a check for five cents or 15 cents or something. So when we took that out of the equation, I believe we ended up distributing about $6,000 in cash. And I think maybe 550 people out of um, by the end of the fiscal year 2007, we had just about exactly um, 1,000 active members. So out of those 1,000 people, I think about 550 got a check, and then um, maybe 200 people got a coupon. So we did something a little different where if the check was going to be less than 2 bucks but more than 20 cents, we gave them a coupon. And then anybody who was going to get less than 20 cents didn't get allocated at all. But everybody got a letter. And the checks ranged from, you know, exactly two dollars to I was in the top ten because I spent too much money at my own co-op and I think mine was about a hundred and seventy bucks. <laughs> and there were, you know, seven or eight higher than me. I just did a quick calculation, Crystal, at six thousand dollars over five hundred and fifty people, it looked like an average of about ten dollars. That sounds about right, yeah. And if you go back to your example of, um, you know, you put $100 in a savings account and you might earn 2 bucks on it this year if you're lucky, um, you know, there's, I mean, I earned $175 and uh, I retained another $600. So my, um, you know, my, my $100 investment just yielded me $750 in cash and equity in my co-op. And a little bit bigger waistline. <laughs> <laughs> of that example. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to touch on uh, before we just finish up with your questions and thoughts is uh, just speaking a little bit about discounts um, the, and, and why we recommend not having an everyday discount uh, as your, your primary method of returning surplus to members. First of all, it really creates and perpetuates a sense of entitlement that people feel like they're entitled to something when they come shopping instead of a sense of ownership that we're in it together. If we do well, we all do well. If we don't do well, none of us do well. Uh, uh, creating um, a sense of this is our business. Um, the other thing about discounts is they're, they're not as flexible. They're very hard to change. If someone bought a membership thinking that they were going to get X percent of discount um, and then it turns out that, it, that things aren't going as well as you thought, it's very difficult to change that. But if you tell people that their benefit is the is a share of the of the sets if the co-op is profitable, um, you're not promising them a set amount. And if if the uh, co-op doesn't do as well, you do have to explain it. They're going to want to know. Uh, but it's flexible. It it varies depending on the on the particular condition. Um, also, uh, with uh, discounts, you can't manage or defer their impact on cash. Uh, they can just be very costly and unsustainable. Um, now, monthly or quarterly discounts aren't really equitable for all people. I think that's what Crystal was talking about before. Um, that, that can be okay if they're an extra benefit, if you have some, some events where you give uh, people an extra incentive to come in or to join or whatever. Uh, but as the primary method, it's, it's not distributed fairly amongst all the members if if the co-op gives a discount on the third Tuesday of the month and I can't shop on that day, I, I can't benefit um, equally. And you want your primary member benefit to be something that is fair and um, equitable to everyone. It can also uh, really create disincentives to promote membership. Uh, that goes back to the, the first two points 
that uh, discounts can be very, very costly to the co-op. And so you want you sort of look at members as, gee, if we didn't have so many members, we might be able to be a little bit more successful. And that's just not the dynamic you want in your co-op. You want a co-op where you're really excited about taking in new members, and the more members there are, the more people who get to share in the in the benefit. Um, the discounts provide a short-term reward, but they don't help the co-op in any way. They don't help build equity. Uh, they don't help build up cash reserves. They don't create that, that sense of ownership. And sometimes they, uh, they inflate shelf prices. That if you're going to give a, a 2 or 3 or 5 percent discount, you're going to have to account for that somehow. And so you, you may have to add on to shelf prices in order to give members a discount. And then that can make your co-op uh, look as though you're not as, as price competitive as you may actually be. So those are some of the reasons why we, we recommend that you don't uh, plan on or offer uh, discounts as your primary member benefit. Um, that's the uh, end of what we wanted to present. We're more than happy to take more questions. Well, I've got several people who are very patiently waiting to have their question answered here. Let's see if there's a few. Um, I'll just try to go through, and maybe this is for Bruce, we'll see that the relationship, what's the relationship between that idea of the pre-existing obligation that you mentioned in the bylaws and this in inclination to retain 80 percent? What's, what's the pre-existing obligation? Well, the pre-existing obligation is how the IRS terms uh, the that they don't allow patronage dividend unless there's an agreement in advance that you will or at least you have the option to allocate your profit to your members as opposed to keeping it in the co-op and paying tax in the co-op. The, uh, uh, the interaction with the 80 percent is that um, the IRS allows you to allocate, uh, you know, say $100 to somebody and then only pay them $20 cash and keep the other 80 in their name as part of your equity. So that, that's an allowable part, and, and that's still part of your obligation. You've taken a piece of your essentially retained earnings and put somebody's name on it that they have uh, some level of claim on you. Okay, here's um, another uh, related one uh, to bylaws and rules. So that if, the, if the bylaws say that you have to have a permission to include patronage refunds in their taxable income, uh, is there referring to members, and does that mean that a member will be taxed uh, on their patronage refund? Uh, well, that that's a, a, a sort of a the IRS set this up for a business. Uh, and most of the co-ops originally were agricultural co-ops, so their members are in business as farmers. If you allocate, if they get allocated a patronage dividend, they're paying tax on it. There is an exception uh, for retail co-ops that are selling things for personal use. That although the terminology says you know, you're allocating it to a member and they have to include it in their taxes, the reality is that, that that your members are exempt from paying income tax on it. That's in that chart. That's that's the neat thing about it is you're avoiding your members are not paying tax on it and the co-op isn't paying tax on it when you do uh, patronage dividends. Nice what a deal. <laughs> yes. Um, but it is important, as Bruce said, to, um, to, to, to use that language that the IRS requires. It's confusing, and there's, there's really not much we can do about that. The IRS is pretty specific about what you, how you have to describe it. Um, here's one that came up a little bit. Uh, as, as you were trying to think about the leadership of the call, trying to figure out how much patronage dividend uh, to give, is there a percentage in terms of how much profit or how how, um, how much of the profit they use or how much profit they would require to have before they give a refund? Well, that's really just a, a practical matter of, uh, as Crystal was saying, you know, do you want to be giving out you know 20 percent checks or coupons to people or not? Uh, so it, it's as much if you've made profit, it, it's then your decision. You know, is it worthwhile to go through the process of, of allocating? to the members. And I might add for our example that, um, like I mentioned, we've been not profitable for many, many years, so we do have some um, retained losses. And um, when Bruce got all of our numbers crunched, he um, told us that 
we wouldn't have to pay any income taxes even if we didn't declare a patronage refund because we have credits from prior years. So we made the decision still to do it as a PR move because, you know, we took away these discounts at the register and as a goodwill measure for our very first year and because we did have a very profitable year, a really good year for us, um, we decided to do it. But I think each year going forward, you know, the person who does our taxes, hopefully Bruce, <laughs> um, will let us know various scenarios and how they would impact our tax our taxes, and then that can help inform our decision. Thanks. Um, do you have time for any more, Marilyn? Yeah, I think we have two more minutes, so I think we have time for probably one more question. Well, here's this. Uh, here's one that uh, um, relates back to your conversation about discounts. Um, is there a, a difference between, say, offering discounts and having a shelf price in the store that, that the non-members pay a surcharge on top of? Yeah, that's a, a different structure, and I don't recommend that structure either. Um, it's a real disincentive for people to to shop at the co-op and uh, then get to the front and find out they're going to have to pay more than the than the it said on the shelf. It's just a real disincentive. It's not very welcoming. It doesn't make people feel like you want their business. And so uh, it it is easier to manage, and it's easier to get a high percentage of people who. If they want to shop at your store, they're probably going to join because they don't want to pay the surcharge. But it's uh, it's not a system that I, I recommend because of its impact on new people who are shopping at your store for the first time or people who just simply um, prefer not to join. Lots of people, um, some research says that as many as 60% of the population are non-joiners. Um, that they just, no matter how much they're aligned with an organization, they won't join it. So. Uh, Rather than creating disincentives for for non-member customers, um, the patronage refunds is the preferred system. And I think with that, um, we should close. I've, I've put up um, a slide with where you can go for more information. Uh, Bruce and Crystal and I would also be be willing to take uh, comments or questions that you have after this seminar. Um, I want to thank um, Bruce Meyer from Wegner LLP, a CPA in uh, firm in Madison, Wisconsin for joining us today, and Crystal Halverson, General Manager of the Menominee Food Co-op, uh, for joining today. I really, really appreciate you both being here. Uh, for you participants, I want to thank you for coming. We really very much appreciate your participation and wish you the best of luck in starting food co-ops in your community. I know I wouldn't want to live in a community without a food co-op, and so I really hope that you'll be successful. We have another webinar next week. Hope you'll sign up for that, and in the next uh, hour or so you'll get a, an evaluation for today's webinar and we it's a very short just a few questions but we really hope you'll take time to fill that out the results are very very meaningful for us as we plan um, information for you so um, Bruce or Crystal anything in closing you'd like to say um, no I just think uh, yes good luck to everybody it, it's a hard challenge yeah, I also just want to throw a big appreciation out to all you that are out there because um, we're going to take over the world someday, so we need more co ops. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming. We appreciate you being here. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, Crystal. Thanks, Thank Michael. You. Thank you. You bet. Bye, everybody. Bye bye.